Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. In the bullpen, much anticipated new book, Dr. Jonathan Metzl, a professor and chair at Vanderbilt University, also author of the best selling book, Dying of Whiteness. This is the anticipated book, Doc, we have been talking about on the show. Good to have you back on the program, my friend. What we've become, living and dying in a country of arms. We're gonna talk about it. how are you? I am hanging in there. It's really great. This is the first day my book launches tomorrow. This is my first interview for the new book. So I'm really honored. I said, like, look, you know, let's I really I really wanted to be talking to you about this. It's really man, important. It, it, listen, man, it's it's a beautiful piece of work. I know your background and your um the nuanced approach you take because it's very research centric. And it helps us understand things in a way that allows us to create solution and remedy. So for those who are wondering what this book is about, and I think they're gonna be surprised of some of the um, proclamations you're making here, Uh, but give them the, the, the summary of your book. Well, I would say there are three main points about the book. It's called What We've Become. And the first is that it's a book about a mass shooting that happened in my hometown, Nashville, Tennessee, in April of 2018, a naked white man burst into a Waffle House in South Nashville, in the basically the black part of town here, um, shot uh, eight uh, young adults of color, uh, four killed, four terribly injured. And it was really, as so many mass shootings are, a, a reckoning in our town about, oh my God, how could this happen here? And I thought this is this is kind of my story in a way. This is the story I, I need to be telling because mass shootings happen so quickly. They're in the news and then we forget them. But for me, there was something bigger going on here. What was the story? How did a naked man with an AR-15 who turned out to be from Illinois, how did he end up in the, in Nashville in a Waffle House full of celebrating young adults of color in the middle of the it was early morning hours after the clubs closed? And so the book is kind of my my long process of tracking down the before and after of that story. And to be honest, it led me to some really unexpected places. Partially, they were the things we know, which are we have terrible gun laws in this country. But partially, it was about a, a bigger question of race and insanity in America and the ways in which our entire system mobilized to protect the, the rights of the naked white gunman in a way. I, I write in the book that he was a reflection of our structural values on the left and on the right. It wasn't just on the right. Um, and so it was really a harrowing five-year case of wanting to do justice for the, for the victims and their families, but also telling a bigger story about how that naked white man with an AR-15 comes to reflect the choices we've made and the choices we don't make. Let me ask you about some cause and effect policy-wise, because there are some things that don't make sense, for example. The majority of gun owners disagree with the NRA on multiple issues. Red flag laws are common sense to most people. Um, Background checks are common sense to most people. And then the special interest gets involved and all of a sudden things get confusing for members of Congress because they have a built in interest to take a certain position that may be adverse to either a gun owners or the majority of Americans. But then you have this response, this reaction, because I think the left is right. So the methodology has been, let's contextualize the the position here, provide a contrast, let's do a demonstration, let's protest, let's make it a health paradigm. Let's talk about it in the context of morality and ethics. What say you to how this has been presented from the left and has the left been right in their presentation of the rebuttal? Well, I'm a liberal doctor. I'm a public health advocate. I think we need stronger gun laws in this country. Uh, I want to be very clear about that. But I think where this book will be challenging for a lot of readers is that I look in depth at whether those approaches would have stopped the mass shooting that I study and the many other mass shootings that you never hear about because they happen in the quote unquote black part of town or they're in quote unquote gang related killings and stuff like that. And it turns out that the policies we're advocating for, I, I think they're important. Again, I wish we had them. But I just think that they, in a way, become window dressing for much, much bigger problems. Uh, And so, again, I I understand. I mean, I've been on the front line of this fight for 15 years. Just doing anything feels like a, a a minor victory. 
But I will say that we, we've rallied around um, the kinds of regulations, um, government databases that people should enter when they uh, when they um, buy their guns or red flag laws are inviting the police to come into your home um, to assess your relative. And what I argue is those those are not going to build our coalition more broadly if we don't contextualize them with broader investments in making communities safer. And so I just think we've gotten into this this corner in a way of arguing for red flag laws and background checks, but not saying we need to invest in making communities safer. That's part of my argument. And the other part in the book is that they wouldn't have stopped the shooter in in my, in the in the case I talk about in the book because even though he was honestly psychotic and clearly saying what he was going to do, he was seen as an, a white man with a gun, somebody whose rights should be protected. And so nothing we're doing addresses the bigger problem, which is the problem of whiteness. What does it mean to be a white man who owns a gun and carries a gun? And until we come to terms with that, I still think we're going to be divided in, in a particular way. So again, I think this is a challenging argument, but I'm, I'm as you say, I'm trying to rethink common knowledge about, about what we think we know and also why we've gotten into this position that feels hopeless and stuck. Yeah, social, ideological, um, political, racial, historical, all of these elements merge to create exactly what we see before us in the material world. Um, one of the dynamics I think you bring to the table that's quite profound um, is this strong ability to research and understand the understand the problem from the genesis of it. So we know whiteness is a construct. It is a social construct. It is a, a, a dynamic that was created. So white means this, and these are the privileges and benefits, and all of a sudden it created a, a psychology from it. How much of that can be unraveled in our um, or through our political arena, policy, laws? Or is it even possible, Doc? I have two ways of answering that wonderful question, okay. and thank you. And, and they're really, it's kind of the two ways that race plays out in this book. Uh, it's interesting for me because dying of whiteness, it was a relatively tweetable argument. You know, white Americans mm -hmm. are dying from the policies that they, uh, conservative white Americans. It made sense yeah. automatically and deeply. Here, I didn't, I didn't start thinking I was going to write a book that was critical of myself in a way, but that was where my research let me led me. And I think there are two things that are important about race in, in the argument I make. First is that we're losing Black Americans, to be honest, in 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 our framing of gun safety. Um, if you look at who are the fastest growing groups of gun owners in this country, it's often a lot of data is. Black women and, and black men are, are buying buy, buying more guns, and they're less likely to feel that gun safety policies represent their interests. And that that for me is, um, you know, it's it's tragic, right? Because black Americans were the strongest supporters of gun control laws for decades. You really could count on, you know, if Pew polls way more because black Americans had seen what guns did to their communities, you know, from the '90s, early 2000s. But again, the policies that we rallied around, um, maybe they were going to regulate guns, but they weren't going to do anything to rebuild communities, to invest in communities, to really rebuild health, information, food, safety, schooling, all these other networks. And so for me, it's it's kind of a, the tragedy on uh, about race. And part of the, I argue in the book is that is that we we advocate for these policies, but we don't pay attention to the bigger structural needs of communities. And that's really gotten us into a tough place. So that's that's part of the race argument I make in the book. But the other thing is whiteness is structural also. And so it's just funny how many white gun owners, I interviewed a lot of gun owners for this book. And the white gun owners said the same thing. You know, there are no cops in my neighborhood. I live in rural areas. Um, I'm, one guy told me, quote unquote, I'm, a, I'm my own first responder. And he, and he was right. And so part of the story is guns become the logic through which we conceptualize our safety while the support systems that should govern society collapse around us. And for me, that's that's the bigger story. We're not going to fix this with policies. We need to rebuild infrastructure. Where's the emphasis? And so let's say you had an opportunity to give a community, you got a pilot project, communities willing to do some things differently. What's your first one, two, three steps to get this done? Well, I have a piece coming out to actually tomorrow morning in the Huffington Post. 
that talks about how Democrats need to message about this issue differently. Mm-hmm. In other words, rushing in and saying more government regulation is not going to convince the purple state voters that we need to convince. So I certainly think it's partially a question of messaging. But I also argue, I, I present in the book a five-part plan of how we can think about guns and gun violence in a much more structural way. And so the things I advocate for, for example, are linking gun safety to entrepreneurialism, um, crafting different narratives about what it means to live in a gun-safe community that isn't just about the opposite of, of what the NRA is convincing, really do a better job of addressing how race and guns go go together. What's the racial story that we really need to, to address? Um, and so I think about it. I mean, I learned a lot interviewing so many gun owners and they said, make gun safety more relevant to my life. I can't feel it. I can't see it. And so I, I propose all these structural interventions that are basically about making public space safer and investing in public, public space. You understand more than most that we do not operate based on reality, but perceive reality. And so the perception of that reality becomes paramount in how we interact. And so messaging is a presentation of reality. Uh, Democrats sometimes can be all over the place. And and then they can surprise you by being ultra conservative on some things, right? Uh, You're not saying, Doc, that Congress or policy and politics and law, they have no place here. You're just saying the emphasis may need to transform, correct? I'm trying to understand how we got here, right? And Part of the story is I've been at this for 15 years and people are are really fighting an uphill battle. But we're also seeing, I think we're also seeing gun laws fall across the entire country. We're seeing more people buy guns, more people carry guns. We're seeing the Supreme Court overturn even New York's gun laws. And so we're advocating for stopping shootings, which is more important. But I also think that um, we're just in a position now where because 20 years ago, we didn't realize that we needed to control the courts to, to implement our agenda. We lost the structural yeah. argument. And so I do argument, I do argue we need to figure out how to get the courts back. And what I show is that advocating for more background checks and red flag laws, I don't think is going to get us there. It's certainly not going to get us there in Tennessee where I'm living. That's, that's an interesting dynamic. So let me pose it this way. If you have less opportunity to obtain weaponry, because right now you can have unlimited guns in America. That, that's, that's ridiculous. Um, a lot of counties, you can't have unlimited cars, but you can have unlimited guns. You have unlimited guns, unlimited ammunition. And because of this, because of the availability of guns um, and the uh, trade interaction, meaning I can literally trade with someone and not tell a soul or do a private gun sale um, and not report it to anybody. Because of these rules that govern guns in America, uh, it allows for more access to guns. And, and I bring the example of other nations that they have violent programming. People say, well, it's violent programming on TV. Well, but they don't have the kind of mass shootings that we have. Um, and that's typically because they don't have these laws that say pro-gun culture. Because I think law plays a part, obviously, in the influence of our societal norming. And societal norming plays a factor in how we think about a thing. And it can work the other way around. And that's what you're proposing. You're proposing that it works the other way around. I'm just saying, if 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 we're successful at doing it in, in this way, reframing, reshaping, but the powers that be still have this awesome power called law uh, and government, they're, and, and they're influencing on the other side. It's almost as if we come to a stalemate, dear brother. And, and I'm posing that as an open question. I debate this at length in the book. I know we're just about out of time, so I'll just say I think there are two points that are relevant. One is that Democrats have protested around a health paradigm, but the Republicans have organized around a power paradigm. That's kind of what I look at in the book. So we have protested again for health laws, which are vital. We urgently need them, but it's hard to do because we didn't have a counter to an adversary that was seating the courts with people who were not willing to compromise. So partially, we didn't pay attention enough to the courts. But the other story of the book is that this this naked might man with an AR-15, he was in Illinois and he shouldn't have had a gun. And then he just drove to Tennessee. He drove to Tennessee to commit the mass shooting like Kyle Rittenhouse and many other people. And so in a way, when we have this patchwork of, of laws, and also you can go from one state to the next state and you go from being someone who shouldn't have a gun to someone yep. who's seen as a patriot whose rights should be protected. Um, 
then then we're just we're not going to solve it. We need to really figure out that that issue of of how we can how we how we can have people look differently at white gun owners who are crossing state lines with AR-15s, which is kind of the metaphor of the book. Yeah, man, I, I appreciate you uh, not only presenting a way to reset the conversation because obviously it's not working uh, in the current conversation, and trusting the research enough because this is what we have to do as researchers. We have to trust the research enough to stand on the research conclusions yeah. uh, and present them as they are. And I'm, I'm very proud of you for doing that. For those who are watching and they would like to purchase the book, maybe even book you for a tour, how can they do so? Just go to my website, uh, jonathanmetzel.com, www.jonathanmetzel.com. And I have all the information about the book and the tour and really everything starts tomorrow. We're having a big event in Nashville with the, the mayor and a bunch of other people and, and the, you know, people who are really affected by this shooting and then, and then working from there. Thank you. Um, thank you for all that you do, uh, Dr. Messel. We'll have you back very soon. Sounds good.